Hey guys, my name is Kristen. I am in charge of the community here at Threat Modeler, and we are so excited to be launching this week. To head off the launch and to kind of celebrate, we have our very first fireside chat with John Steven, who is our CTO, and Nick, who is our Director of Professional Services. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why this community is important for you, a little bit about how it can improve threat modeling, and just have a little bit of fun. So I will turn the time over to you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. And hey, John, nice to meet you. Hello again, Nick. Hello again. Yes. Awesome. So, John, what do you, I mean, the community, that's the topic. That is what we are here to discuss. So what are your thoughts on the community before I dive into more probing questions? Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, OWASP, I just got back from OWASP, um, San Francisco. And, uh, you know, one of the things that G Giamanico was talking about was a um, interview he was having with John Viega, who I, I worked with back in the 90s. Um, and they, you know, they were talking about history. And, and one of the things that they highlighted in their talk was, was that, you know, Ed Amoroso introduced this notion of threat modeling to the modern world in the early 90s. And then, you know, we, we, we began to build that out. And then it became part of, um, you know, the Microsoft uh, practice, and, and they really popularized it with books and things like that. But that was the mid 90s. Right. And unlike the other aspects of application security, threat modeling has really resisted, um, you know, being turned into an easy practice, like some of the other things, static analysis, penetration testing, things we take for granted. Right. So from a community perspective, I think it's really important. We're at an inflection point for a variety of reasons. Right. To take the, the artisans that have made threat modeling, you know, um, a, a practice art on their own and, you know, um, share that knowledge, institutionalize it and scale it out from an industry perspective. So to me, the time is right, um, you know, to 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 overcome this difficulty we've had in the threat modeling, uh, you know, maturation space. You know, I agree to that, but kind of adding a bit of controversy to this entire, uh, you know, subject perhaps is, do you think that threat modeling can ever become that one size fits all, or perhaps, you know, that one methodology, and I'm air quoting the methodology, methodology fits all, uh, or will there always be conflicting opinions? And if so, how can we bridge that gap? Um, I, I've often said, as I do training, that threat modeling is like politics or religion. You know, it's 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 very localized, con, you know, contextual, and, and there's going to be differences of opinion. Um, but I think there are really important inflection points we've hit. So um, one we're going to talk about, which is a compliance driver, uh, which is new to the scene, uh, and that's going to change the physics of our threat modeling world. You know, two uh, organizations such as Threat Modeler have been around for a while, building out and perfecting tooling in this space, which is an essential part of that consistency and scale. Um, and three, the technology landscape that we're threat modeling, which is always changing and always dynamic, has different properties today. You know, this notion that everything is as code um, is something that allows us to, to programmatically uh, reason over um, software configuration infrastructure in a way that's different. So I think, you know, and, and anytime you have sort of three things, you have three legs of a stool and it stands up on its own. So a compliance driver, a maturing tool space, um, and, you know, these as code initiatives making things more, you know, machine readable, I think do change the game to a point where we can take practice and take art and turn it into repeatable. repeatable right. Stuff. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a great, great answer um, without actually hitting the, hitting the topic. But that's, that's, a, that's a very, very good answer. Uh, what I'll ask is next is uh, when you're talking about compliance, specifically about compliance, and now we've just kind of heard about this new um, executive order that's come out um, requiring a lot of these companies, a lot of these organizations, specifically in the Fed space to, to uh, have some, some threat modeling in, in place or something like that. I, again, I may not be hitting, you know, addressing that executive order completely, but 
From a threat modeling standpoint, how do you think compliance really drives it? Well, um, you know, we have an executive order that's come out, uh, 14028, and, and that order has stated specific things. Um, you know, you, thou shalt diagram your software, um, <laughs> which is the beginning of a threat model, and, and thou shalt um, threat model your software for right. uh, design flaws. Now, you know, we've always sort of, you know, if there's a golden rule that ties religions together, there has been sort of a golden rule of threat modeling, which is there should be a diagram and we're looking for things in the design. So um, we have our golden rule and the golden rule is tied to this executive order. Uh, and we have two years to figure out if that's the what, what it right. looks like. And, and so, you know, again, this is something where, you know, usually when this occurs, historically, PCI, some other things, there's sort of been a longer, you know, absorption time frame and process. You know, it, it's already 2023. You know, I mean, we, we've got the holiday season coming up and it's 2023. So we have a year to figure this out right. as an industry. And um, so I think it's going to drive some rapid change, which is why, you know, why we're going to have to sort of come together and ask and answer questions, you know, so we've got a diagram. What does that entail? You know, what is going to be good enough? When we right. talk about design flaws, you know, again, what does that entail? What is going to be good enough? Um, the, the, you know, just if you recall the bad old days of PCI, what happened initially was there was a standard. There was a lot of interpretation to do. And then, you know, basically auditing organizations, QSAs had to come in and determine from their interpretation whether or not you were doing it. And there isn't an equivalent of that in threat modeling, uh, you know, as the industry grapples with the executive order. So right. we are going to have to build that as a community. We're going to have to decide that. And so, um, you know, it's great that, you know, as, as a tool vendor, we can say, look, we've got a tool that's going to help you build the diagram and help you find design flaws. But generally, we're going to lead the conversation on, 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 on these good enough questions. Right. And just so, just so for the curious audience out there, whenever, whenever they get a chance to view this, uh, yeah, I mean, crafting, crafting a way of getting this information out there will still take time. Crafting a way to kind of tackle this new executive order will take time. So what, do, what would you suggest or what would you do in the interim to kind of ease off that anxiety a little bit? of, you know what, there is an executive order looming over me right now. And you know what, I have to do something. So do they go back to what they already know or what they've already been comfortable doing? Or do you want to kind of, do you feel that there is opportunity to shift the paradigm a little and actually become more collaborative still? Uh, both, um, both. Uh, you know, the, the number one challenge that people have when they attempt this is the what I call the blank sheet of paper problem. So they, they, you know, if you're in security, you trundle down to the engineering group and you say, you know, good news, I'm going to do a threat model, bad news, I need some help, I need a diagram. Um, where's your diagram? Oh, you don't have a diagram. <laughs> so you have a blank sheet of paper uh, right. problem, and you've got to figure out what you're going to, to diagram. Um, what I tell people is uh, start with what they have. What they have in engineering will be out of date. It will be too high level. Um, it probably won't have a lot of security elements to it. And, th and that's fine. Um, you're going to start with what they have because that's how they've chosen right. to look at their system and its design functionally. And that's going to be the best basis and language on which you can add the security properties. Now, what are the kinds of things that you uh, need to put on it for it to be good enough from a security perspective? I think that's up for discussion. Um, myself and other seasoned practitioners will have a different opinion on that. But again, from a community perspective saying, look, I took these 13 properties and I did 30 threat models in my organization and I made sure they had authentication and authorization. Right. Notion of persistent encryption, notion of role or capabilities-based access control, whatever your 13 things are. 
um, comparing that with your peers uh, allows you to create, you know, a defensible standard for, you know, I don't know what perfect looks like, but this is how yeah. we're doing it. And it's worked for our organization and other organizations have chosen to adopt in and extend right. themselves. So I, I think, um, you know, that's one of these immediate tiebacks. If, if everybody's starting with what the developers give them and they're coming to a community space and looking at that question of good enough, what are the dozen security controls, um, you know, beyond a stride that I need to right. diagram? What are the, you know, kinds of technologies and the kinds of resolutions that the diagram have from infrastructure up to software? Those are the things the community can meet out very quickly like an expert system would. No, I I hundred percent, and that that to me also is something what a community should resonate. But kind of taking it a little bit to a, a slightly higher level and talking. Uh, today we just started the community, right? We just started the community. Now, in your mind, in your with with the experience that you currently hold in the threat modeling world, and you're willing to basically uh, lay out that experience for everybody else to actually witness and and reshare. What, according to you, is the best version of a community? <laughs> um, so communities, uh, I think, are uh, are tough to talk about in ideal ideal. Um, you know, there's there's no point in trying to get to some crystalline ideal. Um, the best aspect of community is uh, engaged in in sort of vibrancy. Um, so you want participation. Um, what I have tried to do in bootstrapping the community um, that we're publishing is, is write down some answers to questions that I think people struggle with to start. Mm -hmm. Things like, so I'm a CISO, which of my portfolio assets, how many of them, um, what kinds of them do I start by threat modeling? What does threat modeling mean to me at the root of the tree? If I'm a security group owner, how do I then take those mandates and bring them down to my, my SSDL remit? What kinds of things do I threat model? Only big new applications, every release. And then if I'm a practitioner, a security champion or a, or a DevOps engineer, how do I think about threat modeling within a lifecycle phase? Those are the starting questions that each of those kind of sets of roles ask. And right. I'm trying to get over that blank sheet of paper problem. Now, if you take that content out of our community and you, you begin to apply it, you're going to immediately fall into other questions. Questions like, which parts of the technology do I focus on? Oh, which right. parts of my JIRA or Kanban board do I focus on? And so these are things that we're going to follow up and create proactive content on and that practitioners can come to the community and provide their opinions on. When I've done this, here's where I focus. Now, right. 13, 20, 50 practitioners can have different answers to the question of what they focus on. I think a key to maturation of any community which has achieved vibrant engagement is curation. So the trick will be can we take everybody's opinion and can we curate those into, you know, what everybody calls best practices? Right. Um, but, but, the, you know, but true best practices demand actual curation. So right. if we're going to take a stance of bring me your experience and we're going to work together as a community to, you know, synthesize and extract curated best practice from that experience. And so that's a way to get your cake and eat it too. There's a lot of diversity of opinion. Right. And we can take that diversity of opinion and people can use it as a marketplace for opinions they do or don't find valuable and will curate and cultivate and prioritize and emphasize content that, you know, makes the makes um, sort of the most um, you know, ha has the has the broadest kind of appeal and in resonance. No, fair enough. I, I, from what I'm hearing is that this community can eventually become that that place where not only people collaborate to contribute and build content, but actually use content from other people and actually 
figure out things that they could not have possibly figured out um you know in their in the usual okay i'm just going to rephrase that things that they things that they would have eventually figured out but now the community is just basically putting it up in front of their faces because someone else figured it out first yeah i mean the 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 um, you know from a consulting practice in a history perspective you know we dove down a lot of different threat modeling rabbit holes we um began with monolithic server systems you know nt kernel um you know solaris trusted operating systems you know the .NET and java runtime then the web came around and we dove down rabbit holes you know input validation output encoding database security authentication right. threat modeling is a space where it's a activity you apply broadly um, and you need business context but you end up in technical rabbit holes and so any practitioner that comes to a community is going to have just you know popped their head out of a rabbit hole and they will be able to contribute the the valuable experience that they found down that rabbit hole um, as another practitioner i may be you know i may be meandering towards that rabbit hole and so i can pluck that that Let's content help. and consume wow. it and when i come out of the you know because i was accelerated through that you know i may have time to dig into a different one oh absolutely most practitioners with threat modeling recognize that you know there were five big rabbit holes i could have gone down but i only had time for one or two and so my hope is that people contribute you know checklist or other kind of technical assets for those rabbit holes and allow the other practitioners to then do the same thing and you know in any technical arch type whether it's web or mobile or embedded or 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 whatever um there's only so many patterns that you need to get to get to critical mass for the average newer practitioner to get right. to that level of um you know comfort and, and so, so um, you know, this will work best when people, um, you know, reuse those things. And that's going to get just one more thing on that subject. That's going to get us in security to where development has been forever. You know, you know, developers are simultaneously the most optimistic and lazy humans on planet Earth, right? When encountering uh, any yeah. question, I don't mean that as a, an insult. <laughs> <laughs> when, you know, I mean, think about developers, right? Can you build me a product that does this? Absolutely, they always say, right? And then that's why they're slip, right? Because, <laughs> but, but, but then also, you know, why are they lazy? Because they steal, and that's actually a virtue, right? Like open source, you know, right. images, everything is everything is basically copy pasta. So infrastructure as code, go to Google, you get, you know, secure yeah, yeah. infrastructure as code, right? Go to Azure, you get the, their design patterns, right? They're very good at sharing. In security, maybe it's our, our cynicism, maybe it's our, our skepticism, we're not as good at sharing. Right. This community is an opportunity for us to share technology-specific checklists around flaws. Why? But why, John? I want to stop you over here, but why, sure. why, why, hasn't, why has security always been that, that topic of, you know what, let's just keep security to ourselves and not share? Um, I, I think it's... Yeah, you, Psychoanalyzing security people is, is an interesting pursuit. We we do probably do need a fireside chat and, and alcohol for that. But um, there's 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 maybe two things that that have struck me in the past. Um, we were figuring it out for the first time, you know. Um, and as we figured some of this stuff out, um, we we were scrambling to get a report or an answer to the right people. Um, and maybe we didn't have the time to synthesize it. Um, I think that, you know, we're, you know, 10, 10 years ago, we had a lot of boutique consulting. We had a lot of very challenging to use tools. Um, those were all symptoms of figuring it out. Now we're in an era where tools are becoming more open source, more commoditized, more automated. We've figured things out and we've automated it. And, you know, um, the answer to that in the knowledge space has been things like the OWASP um, cheat sheets, which have really exploded over the last five years, um, right. the CNCF guidance for cloud standards. 
the the only part really in my mind that has resisted it is design and because design is is more complex and it's sort of a more mature aspect of it but even that is something we're seeing more and more sharing on again the azure um security you know um patterns the the, the google okay. uh you know um infrastructures code templates and their secure patterns um we're starting to see the cloud service providers really take a leadership perspective on that that's great however yeah. that doesn't work for the average organization because they're not purely gcp they're not purely azure they need threat okay. modeling and threat modeling tooling that spans you know hybrid multi-cloud scenarios that take what gcp azure or you know um, amazon's well architect provide them and combine it with their brownfield where they're at where they've been Right. No, I agree. But I think I think for the most part, and again, correct me over here, but I think all these all these publicly public cloud providers or, or the cloud service providers, their their security measures are also heavily compliance driven. Do you agree? Do you not? Um so I look at it a little bit differently. So they obviously they want to sell to government and they have they want to sell to different um, different verticals that have different compliance needs, so they're they're on top of that. Um, what I see is complexity rose a fair amount, and adopters and customers got buried by complexity. Right. Um, shared responsibility That's a model big, is yeah. a challenge, right? I mean. If you go to a conference and you listen to an AWS architect talk about shared responsibility, they're proud of the fact that 99%, I always quote this, 99% of customer breaches are the customer's fault. That's not shared responsibility. That's like pulling the pin on a hand grenade and throwing it. So you see organizations like Google saying, let's evolve to shared outcome. And mm -hmm. in the evolution to shared outcome, they're saying, we're going to give you um, more, um, the, the patterns, the documentation, the infrastructure as code we, we publish is going to be more holistic. It's not just going to be hardened services and platforms. It's going to be, uh, hardened guidance as to how to build your stuff on our platforms. And so, right. you know, this, this, um, you know, this notion that, we have guardrails for code and for operating, you know, containers, images, and cloud properties. We have guardrails for design is a way to get to the next level of, of, you know, one scale and two security posture in that space. And so I think it's the, I think I would say the prime mover is the shared responsibility model evolving to the shared outcome model. Yeah. And I would say it builds on a foundation of the cloud service providers are exceptionally good at selling to, mature customers, government customers, and they've baked compliance into it right. um, as they pursue that shared outcome goal. Hmm. Oh, I, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, um, I think that was it from my side. I have- uh, So let me ask you a question. Yes, uh, you know, you, you work with a lot of organizations and help them um, tool up for threat modeling. And then you also help them um, you know, answer these questions of where to start, um, you know, what good enough looks like, y you know, you probably hear a lot of common, um, challenges, common barriers, common, you know, roadblocks. What are the kinds of things that you would like to see community address, um, you know, or organizations that you work with contribute, um, to help other organizations address what, what are the hard and they don't have to be solved problems again they can they can just be challenges but what are you what's on your radar i think i think the biggest biggest challenge is where do i start right where do i start how do i do it and and obviously you know then the challenge comes to how do i curate beyond that right we've gone through the conversation about curation which you've rightly said like you know one organization will hinge will eventually hinge on another to to kind of make sure that there is a fully baked baked in content um, for them to, for, for all of them to leverage. Right. But, but I think the biggest challenge, I'll go back to my point is that where do I begin and you know, how do I, how do I know that this threat model is complete? Right. 
so the definition of complete is something which is so which i honestly even i do not have an answer to it right so uh, yeah i mean a question to you do you have a definition of complete in the threat model um i think the first the first uh, article i pushed to to kristen was about the answer to that question so i don't know if this was a plant or what but uh, um so that the one of the things i write about and that i'm it's controversial i think but i'm passionate about is that you know it's like contentment in your life right it's not a thing that you can go buy or 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 something that you can get to quickly it's the it's the completion of the journey almost um complete from a threat modeling perspective is is almost um the wrong goal and so we can understand how the compliance need to have it done whatever that means um is at odds with maybe what the right answer is. Um, so I've advised, and in the in the community, you'll see articles about where to start. Um, if you're in a major release, look at the material that's planned for change or planned for inclusion in that release. Right. Complete means modeling those changes, you know, mm-hmm. and that that priority. Um, and you know, release after release, that focus will change and evolve. But right. if you're if you're fixated on that as the bounds for your threat model, then it becomes more tractable. Right. And it, it aligns what you're doing with the functional delivery goals. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think um, you know step one is define complete in terms of the delivery life cycle as opposed to like the whole enchilada. And mm-hmm. you get you get you get a much more sane and enchilada plate of food to eat. I don't know. There's a metaphor there. And then, and then, then, you know, what, so then the question becomes on the security side, what's complete. We've published an ebook on the 10 most common flaws that I found in practices um, over two decades of, of doing threat modeling. Um, and there's just 10 things that, that I found almost, you know, every threat model I did, or my teams did things like authenticated access without authorization, command injection, in the different forms that it, it, it occurs in new development frameworks. It was buffer overflow, it was SQL injection, it's now SSRF and, and other yeah. things. These, you know, read the ebook on the 10 flaws and you'll see a lot of overlap between the things that I found regardless of the new technology I was looking at mm-hmm. and what assets like OWASP say SVS find uh, and say, hey, you need to pay attention to in this tech stack. And that makes sense, right? The design flaws I see right. repeated tech stack after tech stack. Right, right, are right. Things that are in the web and in other stacks, right? And so, so I think if we focus on the change, this is a long-winded answer, but if we focus on the change and we try to keep cadence with development and we focus on, you know, a list of 12 or so common flaws that happen regardless of the tech stack we're on, that's going to produce, you know, a really solid double or triple each time, if not a home run. Um, and we don't have to, to mix metaphors, eat, eat the whole enchilada, grind everything to a to halt and do a, you know, a two to two week or longer threat model. So right. I think there are answers to that question. I think taking the content that I've already created in that space and uh, other practitioners saying, you know, this is where I felt comfortable. Like I focused on these things each time. Yeah. Um you know, in our organization, we try to keep people on these guardrails um, is going to be a great addition to the general practice. I provide. Right. And so I'd yeah. encourage community users to add their own answer to that to that question. I, and I and I don't know, John, but this one, this one is actually and I just remembered this one that came as, um, you know, another pain point, another another actually a big question is that is threat modeling is threat is threat modeling made to generate something that was not known or is there going to be something which is like is is the output of a threat model definitely going to generate something which is out of the ordinary um uh that's a really good question so the the uh, i did threat modeling as a consultant for 22 years um i went 13 years 13 and a half years doing threat modeling before I delivered my first threat model without a new way of attacking systems that hadn't been documented before. Mm -hmm. Um, So either I'm too old or, you know, an overwhelming majority of the time, you're going to have that kind of newness. 
I think that it's intimidating and probably the wrong answer to say your threat model needs to have, you know, an O'Day or a net new, you know, attack pattern in it. Right. Um, many organizations are very satisfied by saying, look, we have enterprise enabling security controls. We have an identity gateway. We have, you know, this kind of OAuth proxy. We, we want you to use them. And mm. so some organizations use their diagramming and their design analysis to determine whether or not people have simply stayed on the paved road of using their organization's enabling security controls and enabling, you know, or, or secure patterns. And that's a fine way to start using threat modeling and a fine scope to apply it at. Organizations who are more, you know, interested in preventing risk and they're um, you know, risk tolerant uh, or risk intolerant may say to themselves, um, for us, threat modeling means um, making a list of adversaries, understanding their capabilities, right. using the diagram to understand and, and, and surface attack fact, surfaces yes. and right. valuable assets. And we want to create an assurance case that adversaries cannot damage our assets and those organizations are, are going to take less of that compliance um, security requirement. you know did you stay on the paved road perspective and more of that security research perspective um, I think the best security practices that I've seen you know over two and a half decades are ones that do a great job of making sure people stay on the paved road and use the enabling controls mm -hmm. every application, Every initiative does that. And then the ones that they deem risk averse enough do a bit more to understand those, you know, whether or not those there are new and innovative ways that things can be attacked and they're being proactive and preventative. And, and when you combine those two things in a balanced way, right. you know, you're getting to a mature phase, um, but that's not necessary, you know, in the first 12 to 24 months. Does that, does that help? Yeah, it does. It does. And then, so, so yeah, because what I, what I eventually try to, um, and this, I believe like in, in conversations, in previous conversations with you, John, I, that's what I kind of shift the conversation to the, to my, my clients by saying that, you know what, let's start with what your, what those attack vectors or threat vectors or whatever we want to call them, what those are, and then figure out the documentation and then figure out the security documentation as an outcome, as an output of it, right? I mean, it just helps you build a more cohesive. Set I, think, I think what you're talking about is, is, is absolutely great. And I've seen organizations take that approach when, when you know, mentored through it very effectively and and the way that looks to some people is we're running static analysis tools we're running dynamic analysis tools we're paid for training but Correct. we still have the same damn problems exactly. every release on every application exactly. let's campaign away our output encoding problems let's let's campaign away our authorization problems and you know when they campaign a secure design you know, on the back of a threat model that focused on that one problem area, right. they're able to eradicate a problem and get rid of all of that friction and pain in their defect discovery practice. And so I've seen organizations take a threat modeling approach, do the diagram and do the design analysis, but again, again in that, in that stovepipe, in the way you're describing, and just march through their organization one thing at a time and get a very durable you know, improvement in posture on it. So I, I think that's a great way to go about it. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, and then lastly, now this is this is by far my 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 biggest question. Uh, where do you see? And again, this is a very very controversial question. So um, yeah, uh, editors on the videos, you know, if you want to remove this, remove this. But <laughs> the question goes: Is Let's that go <laughs> do you feel there is room for automation? in threat modeling? Um, so that's a question that um, for the first eight years of my public speaking, I answered emphatically, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important for me to uh, 
personally recant that. Um, I, I believe, again, the, you know, I mean, C++, Perl, these languages we used in the 90s when I started security um, were, were, were unparsable um, by, you know, by anybody but the most expert. And, you know, the way that those systems would grow in terms of, you know, mesh and service wasn't very discoverable. So it was very hard for me to understand how on earth you were going to get system level context, you know, out of a completely bespoke bare metal system that was using a completely uninterrogatable language that probably you only had the binary for 60% of not the source code. Right. And, you know, unsurprisingly, I must have written five binary parsers in those days, you know, and, and I mean, we did everything we could to to automate that, but it didn't seem reasonable to me that mortals would follow that approach. We live in a world where, again, everything is as code, right? Your build process is, is right. configuration, like everything is YAML and JSON, right? From your infrastructure's code to your cloud config to your Kubernetes config to, you know, and those things really reach from infrastructure up into application through service mesh. Mm. Um, they touch things like identity access management role and network policy. So I just think we live in a world where, um, where it's now possible, where it wasn't in very objective terms. Second, there's so much of that stuff that if you don't have a way to automatically ingest it and reason over it, you're actually in trouble mm, yeah. because like wow. when I, and I just did a threat model for an organization, you know, and, and there were, there were, you know, truly tens and tens of thousands of lines of infrastructure as code in an Azure environment. Right. And it was Kubernetes and, you know, it was, it was different Kubernetes environments. And if I didn't have, you know, a way to ingest that infrastructure as code and automate aspects of reasoning over it or diagramming it, I would have been completely lost. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think not only is it, sort of objectively more possible now, but it's, it's, it's um, insanity not to no. leverage some amount of, of, of automation in, the, in this process um, because the, 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 the technology tectonic shift has irreversibly occurred. <laughs> yeah, no, because you know, that's, that's, a, that's a conversation that I've not personally been able to have uh, with, with my with my clients specifically when, when, you know, and that there have been a few that have come across with this particular question is that why will I threat model a system which already exists? And, you know, why will I, why will I threat model? You know, what's the room for automation when threat modeling is supposed to be a manual activity. And so that, that is a great answer, right? That is a great answer. I mean, there, there is room for automation everywhere. I, I, I am. Yes. No, buts. next period, next sentence, next paragraph, you know, the there's a false dichotomy uh, around am I doing it before the system exists and I'm being preventative or am I doing it afterwards and am I being reactive? That, that's completely false dichotomy. A system doesn't exist exactly once in its life and for the rest of its life it exists and as we all know it exists in a zombie state for for its post-life and but the point is that it's only new once. And so, you know, net of any kind of very special greenfield assignment, you're threat modeling as an existing system undergoing change. That is the default state. Think about infrastructure as code. You've got this big infrastructure as code dump in your repository. You've got a running system and you're making a change set. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. Same thing. You know, and so, so you actually need to think about reasoning over what is the change to the posture that conceptually my design changes uh, imply or, or technically the infrastructure is going to change set demands. Um, and, 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 and you've got to free yourself from that purely preventative, purely reactive mode. Right. You're, you're actually doing both in, in all cases, but the first one. And so, so um, you know, again, if you've aligned it with the life cycle and you're focused on the change, but you can consume the runtime state, and you can consume the infrastructure's code and know where it's going, then you're in the perfect preventative posture where you can say, I am willing to make these changes because these changes are net neutral or net improving right. your posture, or they're, they're reducing it, but I'm taking a calculated risk. Hmm. So, so I, I think that um, <clears throat> that's, that's a key mentality change that people need to undergo. And it's one that you can only undergo if you have the benefit 
of those visibility tools, which are which are tools. The right. Zoom and, and diagrams on this stuff automatically because you have no prayer of is a human plugging together your AWS configuration, your CloudFormation template change set, the existing runtime state, and like whatever the people diagrammed. That is that's that's where a threat modeling tool is essential to say, here's a workbench. We've got ingesters. We can suck in those four different environments. We can reconcile them in a model and a diagram, and we can run rules over them in in one or or the projected set of all those states. So that that's that's a that's a key, you know, that, that to me is a key use case for tooling in this new new right. Technology environment. Right. No, fair enough. I think that that again, like this is this is exactly the kind of answers that I look for in 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 a community, right? Uh, where it may not be it may not be out there evident where where you know that there may be certain bias in involved with with you know how somebody would want to threat model something or not. But I think the community really will open the the perspective a lot more and kind of kind of help the sharing of information sharing of knowledge which is which is what our idea is right john yeah, yeah i mean you know the practitioners with whom i work and you know in champions programs that are um you know f- puzzling through these things in a cloud environment you know they're asking questions like do i dig into the you know kubernetes clusters how much of the supply right. do i diagram these are great things for people to contribute. This is what's working for me and my DevOps team. This is working for you know me and my you know CloudFormation team or my cloud native engineering team. Like this is what they're focusing on. Those are when I again when I do threat modeling training with people, you know, the developers who come out, you know, come out of the Zoom, you know, bat swinging are asking those questions. And then they're going back with the training material and they're trying to apply right. it and their experience is absolutely what, what my call to arms would be in, in, the, um, in the community. You know, what, again, in the simplest terms, what are the things, what resolution are you diagramming at? Mm-hmm. What kinds of flaws are you finding at that resolution? What kinds of flaws are you, are you, you know, concerned you're missing because you're, you're not, you know, not at a different resolution? Right. And what we see is people, you know, either focusing on the infrastructure aspects of things, and the, the DevOps ones are focusing on the application and the you know, right. uh, identity ones. Those are two common you know, sinkholes. And um, I, I would love for people to begin to write um, you know, template threat modeling material um, right. on those two spaces to accelerate others. Right. And, and to, 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 the nervous, to the nervous community collaborators such as myself, uh, what would your thought be on me not being, or, or, or me, like for me, whenever I kind of, you know, type something out or kind of put it on a forum, perhaps, you know, what it just, it, my, my first reaction is that I am wrong. Right. And perhaps, you know, I have the wrong answer or the wrong method, which kind models of, are wrong. Some models are useful, right? That's I wanted to hear that from you. <laughs> and, and so, 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 um, so, you know, what, um, you know, there's a moderation team in place and there's going to be, so there's going to be support. And um, people like me will be working with contributors. Um, we can work offline or we can work online in a, in a you know, publicly messy process to make sure that um, you know, what you're thinking gets workshopped to the point where you're comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I've already had uh, conversations with contributors and potential contributors about. Right. Uh, I'm thinking about this. I don't know how to, uh, you know, I, there's something here, but I don't know how to. So, and Kristen and I were talking about this right before this, uh, this conversation, actually, this notion that, um, you know, in a former life, uh, I had a project and I called it the, the big dig. And I went out to my consultants at their customers for weeks at a time, and I watched them work. Hmm. And I built a handbook for consulting based on watching them work and acting as an intern or a secretary, right. pulling back their information. And so that's a very comfortable, very satisfying thing to do for me because I learn and that's what I like to do. So I am personally uh, you know, here to help with that process um, for potential contributors, for, for reluctant contributors. And you know, we're gonna take a stance 
um, and make sure that the culture of contribution and that the culture of engagement is constructive and positive and and accretive um so right. so that that's that's a that's a key thing um and a thing that you have to put effort on and the effort has to be explicit on and 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 so you know we know and we'll enforce that thousand percent thousand percent agreed and and i wanted i specifically wanted to hear that from you um so yeah awesome thanks john i i am done with my questions now i thank really you. Am. thank you uh, this was a good conversation, Nick. I, I, I That's agree. awesome. Thank you guys both so much for this conversation. I personally learned a lot. Um, I love listening about kind of how this community can be such a valuable asset for practitioners, especially from the governance side. We talked about that earlier. Also how the community can really change the game of threat modeling as we share and learn from each other. I think that's going to be really awesome going forward. Um, this was a great chat about what can be found in the community, what we have planned for the community, um, and, and kind of how it will develop as we as we grow. Um, thank you also to everyone who joined us. Um, we're very excited to welcome you back to our next Fireside Chat, um, which we will be announcing soon. And with that, I will let you guys go. Have a fantastic day. See you later.